Hello and welcome to today's conversation. Today, our guest will give us a snapshot of LGBTQ issues prevalent in the world and the trend towards which the topic is heading. Today, we have with us Porjono Shen. He is an assistant professor in English at Sonada Degree College located at Darjeeling. He was in teaching there since uh, 2015. He pursued his master's and eventually earned his PhD on cultural geography of Buddhism in Bengal and the Eastern Himalayas. And for this, he has traveled extensively and has been spending the majority of his time on the hills, balancing his work and personal life perfectly well. Join me to extend a warm welcome to Porjonno. Porjonno, how have you been? Let's begin from the beginning. Tell us about your story. How do you identify yourself as today? Tell us about your story of self-discovery. Um, I would like to identify myself as a queer man. And the story of my discovery of my own sexuality goes back to my high school days when, you know, I would figure that I would be attracted uh, to, you know, uh, seniors, senior boys, uh, and not girls or, you know, girls my age or girls my senior, but I would be very drawn in my school. I would be very drawn to these dadas, to these bhaiyas uh, who were my seniors. So, you know, and, and at that point of time, we don't really have a very strong understanding of, uh, and this is is the pre-internet era so you know we yeah. don't have a very strong understanding of uh, sexuality of identity of uh, what it means to belong to the lgbtiq umbrella so at that point of time you of course uh, think that oh there might be something wrong with me and sure. even prior to that if i go back earlier you know uh, i used to be very fond of these disney musicals you know the little mermaid and beauty and the beast and you know now when i look back i would always be attracted to this you know this prince figure and you know i would identify myself with the damsel in distress or the the intelligent uh, heroine protagonist or you know so yeah uh, I mean I guess I sort of knew that I was different from the rest but it was uh, a full-fledged embracing of my own identity that was uh, facilitated by uh, my sort of uh, my college uh, during my college days and particularly during my university days at Jadavpur uh, where I was doing my master's in English literature and I had a lot of uh, faculty members, my professors, I'm very close to some of them, professors like Paramita Chakraborty, Shupriya Chaudhary, Nidanjana Dev, who were uh, very open about uh, issues dealing with gender and sexuality and PC Paramita, as we fondly call, called her PC, uh, she offered a course on queer studies and you know at that point of time it was one of the first courses, I think Delhi University had a course on, it was called Sexual Dissidence and the only other course on queer theory was offered by the Jatpur University English Department. Of course now the scenario has changed and a lot of departments uh, English and cultural studies and humanities departments throughout the country they offer you know area studies queer studies and all of that but at that point of time when I was doing my master's you know the focus was very very limited also this is the pre-section 377 uh, pre-reading yeah. down section 377 era sure, sure. so uh, through Paramita these classes you know they helped me a lot you know they helped me understand that gender itself was a social construct that you know uh, identity itself was something fluid and you know that helped me come to terms with my own self as a queer person and it also helped me open up conversations not just with a bunch of very like-minded people at GU but also with my parents and other people you know relatives back home so yes that would be the answer Okay, and I think it's high time that we demonstrate that we are comfortable with topics related to sexual orientation and gender identity and that we are supportive of lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender concerns. Be sensitive to the assumptions we make about people. Maybe one should try not to assume that everyone we interact with is heterosexual. 
uh, tell us when did you decide to come out with your orientation how did you how did your close ones uh, respond and how important was it for you this section will surely inspire many who are still confused about how to go about it within their own families maybe uh, well uh, this happened uh, during my college days um, i was quite close to uh, a few women um and you know they were very good friends of mine and um there was this incident back home regarding one of my cousins and i sort of had a crush on him or something and you know uh, apparently i confided in him about my feelings and okay. um he came and told my parents about it and okay. there was a huge ruckus at that point of time in the family but as i'm also the only son but eventually i guess i got around to talking to them and i got around to making them understand that you know like uh, for me this is normal and for me uh, i have no no other state of normalcy so you know i got around to talking to both my dad and my mom and i got around to explaining my perspective to them and they were very good listeners uh, and also i guess this is to do partly this is this may have to do with my own class positioning with my own class privilege because both my parents are extremely well educated right. have both been teaching and you know my father was a uh, senior bank manager and my mother has been a teacher so you know both of them were already exposed to what it meant to be you know gay or lesbian so it was not like this was new to them uh, they had to all they had to do was accept the fact that their son was gay this was new to them but the idea of you know being gay or you know that there were gay men or there were lesbian women or bisexual men and women or transgender people that idea wasn't new or novel to them at all so it took some talking it took some amount of conversation with them and i remember what my father told me he actually told me that you know are you sure you're not bisexual you know like because a lot okay. of people you know you yes. know you might not yet have you know explored or known it i said no like i have never really been attracted to women of course i am attracted to women at a very cerebral level you know mm -hmm. i find them intellectually attractive i find them them amazingly beautiful you know i mean uh, in so many ways much much better than men actually to be very honest with you it says that the sexual attraction quotient that doesn't sort of happen so you know i had to explain that to my parents and even truly things were okay it really didn't take too much convincing and once again when i say this i say this with a disclaimer that i understand that this might have had to do with my own sort of class positioning and class privilege because of which my parents could accept or maybe because they were already exposed having you know lived in the metropolitan city of calcutta for so long they had a certain level of exposure and this might have helped them you know come to terms with their son's orientation more easily true so, yes. true um on the positive side coming out can be an extremely liberating experience um yes. as lgbtq people learn who they are gain respect for themselves and find friends to relate to porjuna do you feel homosexual relationships are different from heterosexual ones share your views regarding this um uh the answer would be both yes and no uh if you if you're looking at the emotional angle if you're looking at the love aspect then of course they're no different because it really doesn't matter because you know we have heard this said way too often love is love whether a boy loves a girl a boy loves a boy a girl loves a girl love is after all love and in any relationship you have certain responsibilities ethical you know and all different kinds of responsibilities which you have to fulfill so in a way it's not very much very much different from a heterosexual relationship but uh, i would also say no because a homosexual relationship also has to deal with a lot more obstacles in society okay. than a heterosexual relationship so in that way you know it is tested more often if i might so say because okay. um often two people uh boy boy or girl girl or a transgendered woman in love with a uh, you know uh someone you know of of, of the same or same uh, gender or right. whatever you know uh for them they might have an affair and they might be discreet about it but at the same time in order to go public with this in order for the larger society around them to accept them, the challenges are way more i'll give yeah. you an example maybe that will elucidate yes, yes. a little uh 
uh, say a married heterosexual couple of course our society is still very very patriarchal so even yes. for an unmarried boy and girl to seek rent uh, yes. in a metropolitan city or okay. in a metropolitan city it's, it may be even worse it's yes. not always easy because the first question that's you know shot at you is why aren't you married and you yes. know we don't yes. allow little relationships so of course heterosexual couples have their own challenges and i'm not at all sort of you know uh, reducing or lessening debunking them challenges yes. in any way but you know um say for a married couple when they seek a house or move into a house or even for a straight couple quote unquote straight couple when they seek a house it may be relatively easier for them to find accommodation than it may be for an out gay couple of course uh, given the larger nature of society two men staying together can pass off as friends right so it's just two friends renting a place or two women staying together they can just pass off as friends things are much more difficult for a transgendered woman you know because right. uh, a transgendered woman is much more visible than oh. a sort of you know middle class gay man um you know for her here if i may use that pronoun for her or for here it is far more difficult to get accommodation to get rent so you know in that way a heterosexual relationship is different from a homosexual relationship but if you are looking at the love aspect of it uh, love doesn't know gender right love tran tra love transcends gender so in that sense it is the same it's similar but uh, in terms of the obstacles you might face from society yes they are very very different yes okay um absolutely and this brings us to the next question which is it's often a common assumption that gay men are oversexed or maybe they are mi misrepresented that way mostly in media we can see this rampant in any bollywood masala movie that try to represent gay men what's your take on this um uh, i will just uh, answer this uh... since you mentioned bollywood i remember this recent series was it on netflix or amazon prime made in heaven i think it was amazon prime amazon yes yes amazon prime and you know i was you know watching that series and i was thinking the same thing it's it's a very sensitive and well done series but yes. even there you see the the main character played by yes. arjun mathur i think yes. he has a lot of tricks so you know uh, and uh, once again no badu judgments attached here yes. i get there are once again you need to distinguish we need to distinguish between um two things here uh see in a patriarchal society like india for a man it's much easier to get sex than it is for a woman so you know a gay man yes the the sort of label that they bear of being over sex that's not altogether incorrect whereas lesbian women just by virtue of the fact that they're women for women it's far more difficult to get sex in a patriarchal I'll talk about it maybe exactly you know that we live in um another reason for this is um i would suppose because see a lot of gay men even today they live a closeted life okay so right. only within a limited social circle their immediate circle of friends uh, associates they might be out but they may not be out to the larger family to the larger society so sex for them it's not the case with me but i'm just sort of surmising here sex for them may be just a form of you know self corroboration it 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 might just be their insecurity vis-a-vis -vis the larger society that you know they sort of try to work out through their you know their angst that they sort of try to work out by meeting these absolute strangers and you know betting them um you also you know when you look at these dating sites like grinder you know which are you know very much available in india than romeo you would see that a lot of married men uh, men who are married to women even they are there on these uh, grinder profiles once again no value judgments attached even they are looking for sex with men you know so perhaps you know for them this discreet uh, under the carpet sort of life is a way of dealing with their own insecurities which they cannot really face up to you know in society their own internalized homophobia so possibly yes so whereas the this notion that gay men are oversex it's not altogether incorrect but then again um, not all gay men are oversex so you know it would be wrong to generalize that but the case may vary greatly with lesbian women once again because i said within a patriarchal social setup it is much easier for a man to seek sex than it is for a woman and of course where two men are involved Uh, additional complications are not involved right mm -hmm. there is no risk of pregnancy here mm -hmm. so for a straight man to you know suddenly approach a woman married or unmarried for sex mm -hmm. might be other a series of complications involved there social taboo 
patriarchy, risks sure. of pregnancy, a lot of other things, which are really not the case if a man approaches a man. So it's given our social patriarchal structure, it's just easier. That would be my answer. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, well, true and relatable. Uh, portion of constitutional bench of the Supreme Court uh, read down section 377 to exclude uh, consenting adults of the same gender. Right. The law has given LGBTIQ people a right to life with dignity. How do you think society needs to evolve keeping with this law? Um, that's a very interesting question, really. Um, even if you look at the law, uh, it was a really a long struggle. And primarily, I need to like really, you know, congratulate the transgendered community and also different sort of, you know, social uh, human rights groups and NGOs working with HIV people, living with HIV, right. working with, you know, uh, sure. sexually marginalized people, with transgendered communities, with the Hijra and the Koti communities. They played a very, very prominent role, in, you know, in this sort of legal battle. And if you look at the history of the battle, I think it was as early as in July 2009 that the Delhi High Court had already read this down. But yeah. then again, a sort of two yes. judge then reinstated this Yes. Sometime in 2013, I think it was 11 December 2013. And finally, you know, they decided to sort of uh, have a curative. And this is unprecedented, really, in the, almost unprecedented in the history of Indian law, where actually, you know, a two judge, uh, two bench judgment of the Supreme Court was overturned by the Supreme Court itself. Um, curatives very rarely succeed. But this was one case where the Supreme Court was willing to reconsider its own verdict. And finally, on 6 September 2018, a five judge constitution bench and this is binding upon the entire country they finally read down section 377 to exclude consenting adults of whatever gender mm -hmm. uh, same gender different gender mm -hmm. um, whereas you know I, I think it was justice Indu Malhotra who was one of the one of the judges one of the five judges in the constitutional bench who said okay. that we also need to extend an apology to the LGBTIQ right. community for the years of oppression that they have suffered uh, in society at the same time, whereas the law has uh, given a certain level of a certain degree of acknowledgement to the queer people, to the LGBTIQ people, I think society at large uh, is still quite conservative. Um, then again, also, it varies a lot from place to place, like in big metropolitan cities like a Delhi or a Calcutta or a Bombay or a Bangalore or a Pune, you would find a lot of people, especially the young crowd who are far more accepting uh, than you would say in a small place like uh, Lucknow or right. maybe you know, a small city or a small town. So nonetheless, I think it is important for the NGOs now or for the people uh, who work at the grassroots level, it's important for them to be able to take the various repercussions of this law to the grassroots, you know, okay. to the tiniest hamlet, to the tiniest village, right. you know, in the tiniest district in all the states of the country. Yes, your answer brings us to the next issue here. How does the response of society vary across metropolitan cities and small towns? See, you have been raised in Calcutta, but now you teach in Darjeeling. Do you yeah. perceive any difference in the societal response in both the places? Yeah, of course. And one second, uh, this is not Darjeeling per se. Darjeeling is really a small town. Okay. You know? Okay. It's MLN, the sub MLN mm -hmm. areas of yes. West Bengal, and you know, Darjeeling, Sikkim. Uh, I mean, I would I would consider them as parts of Northeast India. Uh, at the end of the day, they are tourist spots, but they are also you know very small hamlets. They have their you know uh, population of Indian, Nepali, or Gorkhali people. And uh, Calcutta, on the other hand, is a metropolitan city, so of course there is a difference in perception in both these places. And uh, once again, I do not really want to talk about Darjeeling here because that would end up becoming a different talk altogether the talk would go on a different tangent altogether but from what i can say uh, in a metropolitan area the exposure is more and why okay. is that? because you know see a place like calcutta saw the first ever pride walk right mm -hmm. yes. you have the queer film festivals which take place you have the lgbtiq film festivals taking place you have uh, queer icons like ritu porno ghosh who right. is were amongst with, with us right. and you have the Tollywood film industry whether it's Bollywood or it's Tollywood you know whether it's uh, the uh, Pride March whether it's the film festivals because of all of this uh, all of these reasons the metropolis has a certain level of exposure which okay. says 
other place like a Darjeeling or a Siliguri or a Lucknow or uh, anywhere may be lacking, you know, because okay. simply because they haven't had that kind of exposure. So okay. yes, one second, uh, your the answer to this, the answer to this lies there that you know it's mainly due to lack of exposure. Uh, which a uh, small piece does not have, which is there in a big metropolitan area. Okay. You were offering some solution regarding, you know, how NGOs can help. So um, uh, bring in awareness in these small uh, cities or towns. So would you like to continue? Yes. I think, you know, NGOs work with the uh, people living with HIV. They work with, uh, you know, sexually marginalized groups, with Kothis, with transgenders, with uh, gay men. Uh, not so much with gay men, but uh, more with Houthis and transgenders. They work with uh, lesbian women, bisexual mm -hmm. women. And, you know, I think it is also up to them to be able to, you know, what I think is really important in small towns and cities is to have a certain group. Like, for example, see, I, and I'm speaking hypothetically here, if I decide yes. to come out in a city like Calcutta today and if my parents and immediate uh, family members are not accepting me, okay, I can always, you know, find some kind of sense of community in this NGO networks. I can give a phone call to a counsellor, you know, things like counselling, you know, these things are very easily accessible in a, in a big city. Whereas these are not the case in a small place. So I think to have a sense of community, to have like-minded people, queer and not, not queer, you know, straight, you know, whom you can talk to, whom you can open up to about your identity, to have this kind of a space in small towns is very, very important. And I think uh, the NGOs, it is up to them to be able to open up this, mm -hmm. you know, network of uh, community support Yes. even in the small towns, even in the villages, you know, so that, you know, people might access these and people might talk about their experiences, yeah. True. Uh, well, you shared some amazing insights, I must say. Uh, we are curious to know, what do you think is the way forward legally? Do you think gay marriages and civil unions are next? Um, see, um, if you closely, we closely look at the judgment that has been given by the constitutional bench. And if we also look at the NALSA judgment prior to that, the NALSA judgment was a judgment on privacy. And, you know, it was, I think it was a three judge bench. And even they spoke about how 377, you know, infringed upon privacy. And then if you look at the constitutional bench verdict, it does have a lot of scope in that it sort of, you know, it, uh, the, the major sort of thrust of this is see um, our constitution, forbids discrimination on the grounds of caste, religion, ethnicity, sex, all of this, you know, uh, before this judgment, prior to this judgment, sex would be seen as collapsible with gender. But okay. after this judgment, sexual orientation has also been read into this. Okay. okay. So, okay. Yes, this judgment has a lot of scope and using this judgment as precedent, one can in fact argue for some sort of a civil union for, you know, uh, enjoying the same rights in society for a gay or a lesbian couple to enjoy the same rights in society that a straight couple has. But more than that, I think it is very important to first have anti-ragging laws in place. Okay. You know, a lot of people, particularly members of the transgendered community, they do, even though, you know, now they have a lot of provisions for them, uh, legally, although, you know, the transgender bill is, uh, it's open to different forms of contestations and, and, and very validly so, because it's not a very fully thought out and formulated bill. At the same time, you know, some legal provisions has been made for them. But however, I think more than anything, you know, we need to first have anti-ragging laws in place, mm -hmm. like, you know, just like, you know, uh, ragging a woman or, you know, catcalling a woman or, you know, obsession approaching a woman, these are all criminal offenses in a workplace, in a school, in a college. I think one also needs to figure in queer people, bisexual mm -hmm. people, lesbian women, transgendered men and women into yes. these. These laws are, at the moment, given a patriarchal society like India, they may be more important. I'm not saying that gay marriage is not, isn't important. Of course, you know, one would want to, you know, have a certain meaningful civil union with one's partner. And another reason why I think civil union will later become important is because, see, uh, suppose I'm living with another man or suppose a woman is living with another woman. Uh, and what happens when you die? Now, ideally, if it's your spouse, the spouse gets the no, right no. to property and to whatever money you have in your account. Sure. But here you actually have to draw up a gift deed, you know, 
everything mm. everywhere even then a lot of questions will come up why are you you know there might be cousins and true. you know other sisters and brothers who might be claiming and you know true, true. these are certain legal issues which need to be sorted out and i'm sure eventually in 15 20 years india is a very fast developing economy it's it's a growing democracy so yes you know all of these issues are bound to come up sooner or later and we have to move forward one step at a time right so yes i'm certain you know these will come up well it has been encouraging to see that during the past few years there has been increasing recognition by both professionals and the larger society uh, that youth who are lgbt exist and have needs goals hopes and dreams like all other children and youth it's actually beyond my understanding why would people assume a discriminatory attitude towards people who belong to this community you and i along with so many friends of ours have been raised and taught together by the same set of teachers sitting on the same benches lunching in the same wash on the cabin like usual individuals right yes absolutely you know and i think um see uh, once again i would reiterate this that for i think a lot of the younger generation people like you and me or people even younger than us mm-hmm. you know i mean we are not really young anymore but you know yes but, but right now you know even you know school kids you know i i i'll just share a small incident with you you know and this is one of my colleagues at the college where i teach uh, my colleague is a small daughter i think she is in class 8 or class 7 and my colleague i'm out to my colleagues my colleague knows my orientation um she is not very theoretically well versed about you know the differences between gay bisexual transgender and all that but she knows you know uh, what it is i think she told me an incident with the daughter and and mind you she's in class 8 she comes and says you know hey mom i saw this uh, show on netflix and they had a very nice beautiful portrayal of you know a uh, gay couple and i really loved it it's so very forward thinking and all of that and mind you this is a girl in class 8 who studies mm-hmm. in class 8 mm-hmm. who is talking about all this you know so i think children today the younger generation today are far more accepting of diversity you know because of the internet because of a lot right. of right i was just going to say that is internet doing what the syllabus should have done in terms of you know when you re- when you introduce a chapter called reproduction in class 7th or 8th like you do not only give them two gender forms you have to now slowly start introducing them to the different orientations that we have in this world do you think so absolutely um uh, once again you know like a, a funny repartee here you know uh, in most schools uh, you know uh, teachers would in, in my school when i was in high school i mean the teacher the chapter reproduction she, she just said read it by yourself and <laughs> that was that okay, okay. so uh, uh, you know a lot of uh, teachers a lot of you know especially teachers they still have taboo talking about okay. something like even Two gender yes you know even that is itself a taboo so yes even if school textbooks are inclusive and they should be absolutely they should be uh teachers have to break new grounds mm-hmm. in order to you know uh mm-hmm. approach the students but absolutely you are uh, right you're bang on the point when you see that the internet has done a lot of these because you know through netflix and now with the lockdown and through very easily available series of shows on netflix amazon prime cartoons everything you know you, i mean i mean every other series on netflix has a gay or lesbian character and you know it's not just the adults watching it's also young children watching you know so they have an idea about what this means and tomorrow if a friend of theirs comes and tells them in i'm giving this girl for example citing the example of this girl i'm mm-hmm. sure if a classmate who is a boy comes and tells her hey friend you know uh, i just likes another guy i'm sure she would not frown upon this at all because you know she's already exposed so okay. yes the internet is doing a lot of what teachers should be doing but at the same time that doesn't mean the teachers can you know abscond from their responsibilities i mean they also need to be more open uh, not just about homosexuality not just about transgenderism but also about uh, you know uh, there's a lot of taboo in indian society about the topic of sex and sexuality mm-hmm. itself so i think we need to be frank with our children we need to be talking about these things uh, we We, and you know that is that lots of prevent them from doing wrong things you know if you talk with them openly if you sure. discuss things which are out there and which are existing which you discuss with them with an open mind i think children are smart enough to understand to appreciate and to select what is good and what is bad for themselves so yes 
well i just hope everyone encounters such friendships early on in their lives to understand how normal life can be to understand that most of us share the same set of values and morals and all it takes to put down a homophobic joke is courage thank you for junno for being here today and sharing your story of courage and acceptance i'm thank sure you for having me over and providing i'm me. i'm sure you have inspired many of us today thank you